Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer, Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, columnist and author, Austin Bay. Jim, you've been involved in several game designs around the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, six. I, six. <laughs> yeah. So um, what did you learn about the battle uh, from, or actually, I mean, I've been reading uh, Trevor DuPay's book and he goes, you know, it's a misnomer to call it the Battle of the Bulge, that we should actually call it the Ardennes campaign because it was a series of battles. But what did you learn about what happened in the Ardennes in 1944 when you did those games? <laughs> well, you know, with each game, I learned something new. And uh, I tried to keep them simple, although I think the, the first game was very complicated. I went in there and the map represented every road that was open through the bulge and where the bridges were and what have you. It was a real horror show, you know, putting together. But it made it clear that the French were correct in assuming that the uh, the Germans uh, could not reasonably expect to put a major force through. Uh, they did have, there were two uh, units that were uh, mobilized in the mobilization plan. I think they were Belgian. But anyway, they were supposed to go in there and man certain key points, you know, and basically slow any Germans down even more. But they got there late. And unbeknownst to the Allies, the Germans had worked out a plan. That's where I got the idea for you know making a map that showed every every road, passable road, where the bridges were and what have you. Uh, and they had war gamed it out. And they found out that yes, it was a near thing, but they could move a major, you know, force, you know, including uh, infantry infantry and, and mechanized divisions, you know, through and basically come out in the Allied rear, which is precisely what they did, much to the consternation of the French. And the Belgians, and of course, ultimately the British. The um, but I learned as as time went on, as I did more of these games, <laughs> it was like peeling an onion. Um, by the last one, I realized the importance of uh, leadership at each leadership and experience at each level. Uh, in fact, I think the last one we had to call for tie-in purposes. We were doing you know movie deals at that point. The whole called the Big Red One. And I concentrated on, you know, on uh, on the history as it were of the first infantry division. And what I realized that they were one of the most experienced divisions uh, in American divisions in World War II. And Trevor Dupuy, that's D U P U R, if you want to look him up, he wrote several books on the quality of uh, American and uh, American divisions from both sides, from the Ameri- from the Allied side and from the German side. And the Germans, of course, they, they, a lot of them were 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 the same picks. But in some cases, the Germans picked divisions that the Americans didn't really consider first rate. But the Germans had different criteria, obviously. And they found that, yes, some divisions, this is both in Italy and in in, uh, Europe, um, you know, were more effective than the others in terms of, you know, their combat power and their ability to inflict German casualties on the Germans without losing a lot of their own people. Um, and uh, that led to another game, which really had nothing to do with the Bulge, called NATO Division Commander, <laughs> which was which basically focused on the quality of leadership. And uh, the CIA, of all people, later adopted that one as a training exercise for new analysts who did not have any military experience at all. And they found it quite useful. Also, the, uh, the, the division, NATO Division Commander, unlike my Bulge games, was a uh, was a uh, how should I put it a hidden game? In other words, neither side could could see what was really out there. They could only rely on their own intelligence. And I worked that in there as well. The bulge, of course, was somewhat simpler in in its uh, in its uh, uh, composition. It was a classic uh, assault on what was believed to be a uh, enemy you know weak spot. Uh, the Germans realized uh, towards the end of the war uh, when they took heavy losses um, and that the allies were basically um, had considered the, uh, had the the Ardennes front a quiet zone where they could move either new units like the 106th uh, Infantry Division, which was brand new, 
and the 28th, which was a National Guard division, which was quite experienced, but like many American divisions have been chewed up in the Battle of Perkin Force, which is on the north, to the north of the Ardennes area. And as a consequence, the divisions in the Bulge area, that the Germans were uh, confronting, uh, were either uh, untrained, un- inexperienced, or, or undermanned and worn out. And the Germans thought they'd be, you know, a pushover. Well, they were wrong. But that was their mistake. The German generals advised Hitler not to do it because to to get the uh, the correlation of forces, as the Russians called it, uh, to uh, have any success at the uh, the uh, assault, whose objective was Antwerp, the major port, uh, bringing in Allied supplies. They finally overcome. They had to clear the port, make it make it usable again, and then they were no longer dependent on the Red Ball Express. You know the uh, <laughs> the trucking route uh, from uh, Normandy, because the railroads we had totally devastated uh, for the. Uh, for the uh, D-Day offensive, which was very, very effective in slowing down the Germans reinforcing it, but it had the unfortunate side effect of making it very difficult to use it uh, once you captured the rail lines and the depots and what have you. Uh, but the Germans realized that if they could get they get Antwerp, they would they would basically slow down uh, Allied offensive operations for months. Uh, which they didn't realize at the time. If it were, if they delayed the, their their defeat too long. Uh, we were prepared to drop the atomic bomb on Berlin rather than, you know, um, uh, Japanese targets. Um, the all these were unknowns, but the the uh, the outline of the battle was quite simple. It was a it was just like many other battles in World War Two, like the Battle of Kursk, where the Germans were going to break through what they thought was a weak point in the Russian lines. Um, various battles earlier in the war where the Germans succeeded in finding the weak point, weak point and exploiting it. Um, and it didn't work at the end of the war because more of the allied units were experienced, you know, even those units that were sent there to rest, um, were, were experienced troops. They, they wouldn't, they wouldn't break under fire. They wouldn't panic, which is what happened to the 106th division. Uh, they, that, that, that division lost though, two of, two of its regiments, uh, you know, 9,000 troops, you know, out of about, you know, uh, 14,000. Uh, it, was, it was the worst uh, loss by one division for us in the entire war. In fact, the casualties, <coughs> the, uh, the wounded and dead, were higher than any other uh, battle that the uh, Americans fought because it was mainly an American battle. That only about five, six percent of the troops were, you know, British, um, and uh, it was basically won by determined defense in areas the Germans expected to go through and. It was uh, defeated by the Americans realizing the importance of the bridges and rigging them for uh, demolition if the Germans got too close. Obviously, once that once the, the once the uh, bridge was blown, it was useless to either side. Uh, but that was less of a problem because the uh, the uh, the danger to the Germans came from the uh, the uh, American troops advancing from the north and from the south, especially. Now, this is another interesting lesson in command. Um, Patton's Third Army. Now, he was fully committed uh, to being the first to cross the Rhine. Um, and he had pushed further into uh, German territory than anybody else. And the Germans thought, well, you know, that his Third Army, no way they could put a lot of their force against the, uh, you know, the German offensive. But he did what the Germans considered the impossible. Uh, he basically turned front to flank in record time. And his units were the first ones to basically enter the Bastogne and uh, start rolling up the uh, German flanks, which caused the Germans eventually to pull back uh, when they realized that they were being pinched, uh, you know, on the bulge. And uh, they lost. The Germans lost. The, the American losses were were, were replaceable. Uh, one of my uncles was almost put in the 106th Division, but he got a 24-hour delay in, in reporting because my grandmother took ill and they thought since he was the oldest, you know, son, uh, he, he would get a 24 hour to be there if she passed away while well, she recovered or she got better. And he turns uh, run in and instead of going to the 106th as a probably a truck mechanic because that was his uh, me- uh, mechanics was his skill. He became a maintainer on a, a, a uh, for P47s, which were heavily involved in the Battle of the Bulge once the weather cleared. Uh, the Germans also expected the the uh, uh, typically bad weather. 
in that time of year, a lot of fog and, and oh, cloud uh, overhead, which basically in those days, no smart bombs. You had to come in low, slow, and, and you know, with rockets and, and bombs and even machine guns uh, to uh, shoot up the enemy. Uh, but that eventually cleared uh, sooner than the Germans expected. They made an attack on some of the forward airfields. My uncle's not among them. And destroyed oh, several hundred, 400, I think, American aircraft. And uh, But they were quickly replaced. We had plenty of aircraft in, in, in reserve, not as many troops. Um, and uh, uh, the German losses, in effect, were permanent. Uh, the Allied losses were replaceable, even for the uh, infantry and armored divisions. We, we had we had plenty of armored uh, vehicles waiting at the uh, waiting further back, you know, for uh, replacements at had and for uh, uh, vehicles worn out, and uh, the Germans did not. Uh, so the while the Germans, you know, uh, lost, uh, uh, you know, about eighty six thousand uh, casualties. Uh, they couldn't replace them. In fact, another problem with the Battle of the Bulge for the Germans was in order to, again, to give it that, that chance of uh, succeeding, most of the attacking divisions were panzer divisions. Most of them, the SS panzer division, the favorites, as it were, uh, of the uh, the Nazis, the, uh, the Schutzstaffel, as it were. Uh, they always got the most fanatic, you know, volunteers and the best equipment. And, and uh, they were chewed up big time. And uh, so the Germans were never able to mount uh, much of a, a defense in the east. So it helped the Russians, although they'd never admit it, uh, because, you know, they had an easier time uh, blasting the way to Berlin uh, because of the uh, the Germans had no, no uh, reserves, as it were. All the reserves were uh, tied up in this one big gamble uh, to uh, stall the uh, the Allied offensive for months and months because uh, Anthrop would, Anthrop would be wrecked. They couldn't get through by air. They tried V2, the ballistic missiles, uh, uh, against them, but that was a imperfect weapon, as it were. They could hit area targets, but it couldn't pick it couldn't pick out key targets <coughs> like ballistic missiles can today. So it was in some ways a modern war, but in other ways it was a uh, it was a it was a it was an older war. In other words, the Germans depended a lot on horses. They had like 50,000 horses, uh, mainly for the infantry divisions and some of the um, supply units. Uh, something people don't realize to this day was World War II. Uh, most of the transportation the Germans used was horse drawn. Uh, only the American uh, army had totally motorized before the war, and the British motorized during the war. Um, uh, they basically, uh, as, as war went on and they returned to, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Europe, uh, and, uh, they basically got rid of all their horses and they were completely motorized, but they were much smaller force than the Americans. So that played a role in it. Uh, in other words, the Germans lost what they could not replace. We lost what we could replace. Um, the other thing of course, was the Germans did not expect the Americans who were in the way, even though they were. You know, some of the, a lot of them were veterans, you know, except for the, uh, the, the 106th. And there was another new division, but not as new and not as uh, ill positioned as it was the 106th was. Uh, they did somewhat better. But the thing is, the, the total surprise of the initial attack, one of the divisions it fell on uh, was the 106th. Now, that was up north, uh, which is not as critical. The, the, uh, the, the, the center section you had the 28th and Ar an armored division, uh, various combat commands in the uh, 9th Armored Division, and more came in. Um, this is something else that was learned from uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Because of that, the, the army eventually adopted the uh, the uh, combat command uh, brigade uh, uh, organization. Uh, and and night by 1960, uh, during the 50s, they basically had some cockamamie pentomic division, but that's another story. Um, but they realized that for a mobile war against a near peer, as we say now, you know, a somewhat modernized uh, op opponent, uh, you need to be decentralized. You need experienced troops that led to major reforms in the 70s and 80s when we went all volunteer and we could train the troops up to. Uh, you know, the levels that they would normally only attain in wartime. And we saw that demonstrated in 1991 in the, the Gulf War, where, uh, like, especially the Battle of uh, what, what 16 Easting, um, a, a, a non-tank unit basically chewed up 
a uh, a, a a much uh, a superior um, Iraqi uh, armored unit simply because of superior training. And it even surprised some of the uh, commanders. They realized the troops were well trained, but they basically their their fire discipline, uh, their discipline on their fire, many for the first most for the first time, um, was impressive because the Germans. <laughs> Al and I appeared on a lot of t- uh, TV shows at the time, the pushing books and what have you, and they were talking about the Iraqis and the um, and a, a battle hardened de- uh, desert army, and and we had to point out, which turned out to be true in '91, that they weren't battle hardened; they were basically battle shocked. Uh, they had lost all you know uh, uh, interest in getting involved in another major war. Most of the troops were uh, infantry, were Shia, who had to be bribed, as it were. Into remaining loyal, um, we, it was it was sort of joked about how uh, Saddam Hussein spent a lot of money, uh, you know, ten twenty thousand dollars, sometimes just a new car, uh, for the families of every Shia soldier killed, because without that he couldn't get any more. They were draftees, but the last thing Saddam needed was a rebellion by his his Shia majority. Sixty percent of the population were Shia, um, and the other twenty another twenty percent were Kurds, and they were not friendly either. But they were way in the north um, that he could not afford to alienate him. And it was the, you know, his Arab allies who basically paid for all that. And he repaid them by invading Kuwait to eliminate the debts he owed them. That didn't work. Anyway, the uh, we we learned a lot of valuable lessons, which a lot of people don't realize. I mean, they were they were being learned slowly, but they really were put under stress during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the Germans were, you know, uh, you know, basically uh, astounded, as it were. Uh, by the determined resistance of, of even logistics units. Uh, in one case, uh, they, they roll down barrels of uh, petrol, uh, petrol gas, uh, uh, gasoline um, with fuses on them, so to speak, to the bottom of the hill where they burn. And then when the Germans got too close to a fuel depot, they just get out and, and left behind some uh, explosives that went boom. And all that fuel went up in the faces of the, uh, of the Germans. And the Germans did carry some, capture some supplies, and they expected to do that to keep the offensive going. But they were never able to capture enough. And it was all these blown bridges, you know, one bridge after another. Bridges which they knew from the uh, 1940 offensive were essential because if, if that bridge was blown, you had to detour to another one. That one got blown up. They could not capture those divisions. They made their only night parachute jump. They couldn't jump during the day because they had no, you know, they had to fly above the clouds and they were, they were you know, uh, sitting ducks for uh, allied um, fighters, which had air supremacy, not just air superiority uh, by that point in the war. And um, so they, they really had no way, even though they had one unit of uh, uh, German troops uh, coming through in, uh, in American uniforms. Unfortunately, not enough of them spoke, how should I put it, impeccable American English. <laughs> you know, when an American soldier comes through to a checkpoint and they ask, they talk to him and he speaks in a British accent, they get a little suspicious. And then if they ask him who's, who's gonna, who won the last World Series, uh, then you got them. They hands up your your prisoners, and you're going to be shot for uh, fighting out of uniform. Um, so the Germans had a lot of ideas, which in theory would work and give them an edge, but none of them did. The the Germans persevered. That's why they took such heavy losses. But they couldn't take Bastogne. They had two airborne divisions in there, which the Germans realized were the elite of the elite. But they said, "Hey guys, you're surrounded. You got no supplies." Um, and General Nikolov said nuts, and they had to be translated to him in, to an g- understandable German turn, and, and the translation was go to hell, so they understood that. Um, and so they were demoralized. They said, my God, these Americans, they thought the Americans were basically coasting to a victory because they had all these bombers and all this artillery, and it also will go into that. One thing we developed in the 1930s was a mass fire uh, um, technique, which we were the first with. Um, and what it meant was we'd use our superior communications and uh, organization, and we basically had a system where if, 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 a, if a foreign observer, you know, called for a, they had code names for it, and uh, for a certain type of fire, and it, and it quickly bounces up the chain of command. So within, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you could have not just, you know, uh, 18, 12 or 18 guns defending that position, but you could have every gun within range, which might amount to, you know, 50, 60 or 100 guns, you know, firing, you know, all they all they had. And they usually had a lot. 
Um, and uh, some German were captured thought that was unsporting. You know, that's not the way you fight a war, but they didn't realize how Americans fight wars. Um, so it was a lot of surprises, not really to the German generals. They told Hitler, look, we have a chance of, of slowing down the, uh, the uh, Russians who, who are basically on their last legs. Uh, that was realized, you know, uh, when the Americans first met the German troops, they noticed a lot of them were Asians. Now, the Germans, uh, the Russians did not like putting Asians into their infantry units because they didn't trust them. And uh, but, you know, as the war went on, they had to, uh, you know, in and a lot of them didn't speak, uh, you know, Russian. It's more they spoke Russian as a second or third language. Um, so, you know, it was it was obvious towards the end of the war that the uh, the Russians were running out of resources. Um, but the Germans were even, even in worse shape because they wasted a lot of theirs, which again, as I said at, at the beginning of this, if they hadn't, if they had managed to slow it down, they would have gotten nuked. Uh, that did, that didn't, how should I, I think come to them until after the war when it was all over. Um, and, uh, they were more busy feeling guilty than feeling, you know, uh, pleased as it were that they, uh, they surrendered quickly. Um. So you know there was the there was the <laughs> there was the Battle of the Bulge. It 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 cost us a lot, but it also validated a lot of the lessons uh, learned, as it were, that were eventually uh, in, implemented. Um, uh, Colonel Ray Macedonia and I wrote a book after in the 1980s, I think it was called Getting It Right, where we basically detailed you know how that process worked. And, uh, oh, one thing that came out of the, the study of the uh, the 1st Infantry Division, one thing they'd learned was you can never have an, too much firepower. And what they had learned to do was when they captured a lot of German weapons and ammunition, if they had enough, they would just repaint our German howitzers. The Germans had a lot of these infantry howitzers, which were meant for, you know, they had uh, they were better defended. They had more defenses on, on the front, as it were. And uh, they were uh, had sites basically firing direct fire directly, you know, at a target the crew could see. And um, they had dozens of these, and they just repainted. Most Americans thought, "Oh, that's something novel. When did we invent that?" And um, uh, they would they would capture vehicles, you know, if they were usable. Um, and so when they rolled in, they rolled in, you know, looking like you know an odd army, as it were. But they were the most combat effective. More importantly, the staffs of the 1st Infantry, as well as Patton's 3rd Army. Now, Patton was another story, uh, story that most people don't realize. He was an excellent staff officer. Uh, there was a 3rd uh, Army After Action Report, a huge volume. Uh, you won't find too many copies, but I directed a lot of people in the Army to the ones up at the Army uh, Research Library at Carlisle and various other uh, libraries. And a lot of troops were amazed because... Um, Patton basically got the best people he could, staff people he could. His intelligence was as quicker and more accurate. His staff planning, he had alternative plans for doing what the Germans thought he could not do, was turn an entire, most, the, the, most of an entire army around in record time, in, in, a, in, in a couple of weeks, and advance in another direction. Even the Germans thought that was very you know, unlikely. But they didn't realize that German uh, Patton was, you know, of German ancestry, and he was one of our German generals. Uh, some of our best generals actually were were Germans. And in fact, you know, the joke was at the end of the war was the Germans didn't realize that we had more Germans, loyal Germans, or, or Germans willing to fight for their country than the Germans did, because the Germans still had a lot of Germans who really didn't want to get involved in another war after World War One. But that was another story that was lost, you know, until long after the war. Uh, people, you know, uh, became aware of that in both the United States and in Germany. Um, but the the lessons the American army learned about what worked and what didn't work, not just in battle, but under the pressure of a, uh, you know, a, a, a superior force, um, you know, could be incorporated into a peacetime army. And so we basically developed an army can, you know, uh, win the first battle. Which American armies, you know, in the past, uh, you know, had a very difficult time doing because uh, from the beginning of you know American wars, the American Civil, the Revolution, and up through you know the Civil War and uh, beyond, uh, most of the officers and troops uh, who were at the war in the war at full when it was at full strength uh, were, were former civilians. Uh, some of them had been in the National Guard, uh, the, the Guard units, which got minimal training. 
uh, some of them were veterans of past wars who were brought back in. But the vast majority, even in the Russian army, um, uh, were basically, uh, you know, managers and, uh, you know, uh, running direct uh, collective farms or what have you. They were all conscripted. And so a lot of your, your division and regimental and battalion commanders uh, were these guys who were basically civilians. Uh, before the uh, the Germans attacked and they had to go in. So, uh, you know, the Germans already knew that. The Germans basically uh, developed a system where they could train troops who could basically win, uh, you know, their first battle, which they did. Um, uh, we had a day, was a thing I was invited to down in uh, 1982, I think it was, uh, where they brought in two Wehrmacht generals uh, to discuss, you know, what we could learn from them. And that's one thing that came out. That the 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 Germans basically had you know better trained officers and troops uh, than anybody else, including the Allies, and um, and uh, they basically developed new tactics faster than the Allies did. They did it in World War One, and they continued doing it in World War Two. But as the wars went on, the talent, the experience, and talent gap closed, and by the end of the war, you had American tank units, for example. There were several notable you know battles. Where an experienced American tank uh, regiment would defeat a um, a a German brigade, or uh, you know, armed with uh, equipped with you know uh, better tanks, you know, Panthers, and even the, the later Mark IVs were better than the uh, the Shermans. But uh, our troops had experience; uh, they basically survived a lot of battles. They had better tactics, and knew how to carry them out. And we basically walked all over the Germans. That came as a surprise to a lot of American officers, including generals who had not were keeping, really keeping track of that sort of thing. But by the end of the war, by the bulge, um, you know, people like Patton and uh, well, even Eisenhower realized that, um, that, uh, you know, this was our advantage. Now, the, we didn't boast about it uh, because it was like a secret weapon. Uh, Hitler was slow to catch on, but a lot of his, uh, you know, junior officers were. Another oh, one last, uh, you know, uh, lesson learned: the Germans realized didn't they didn't they never figured out that we were reading their codes, their Enigma, you know, uh, uh, encryption. And but they did realize that uh, if they if they broadcast if they basically sent any messages involving their their Ardennes offensive, you know, wirelessly uh, or even by telephone. Uh, the Allies might catch wind of what was going on, so all the uh, the orders, as it were, were hand delivered, and, and none of the couriers were captured. Yeah, you know, they made sure of that, and um, uh, so they were they were pretty secret. But even with that, you know, we were sometimes criticized for not expecting the offensive. But you know, like what happened in Korea later on, there were signs that the Germans were planning something because they were, they were, the troops at the front were reporting a lot of noise of, you know, tanks make a certain noise you can't mistake. It's not a bulldozer, it's a tank. And a lot of the experienced troops at the front says, look, we're hearing German tanks, but we're not seeing them. You know, at, in, in, as the winter, as the weather it got colder and it was quiet at night, you know, silent night, as it were, um, uh, Troops sitting up there and say, "You didn't hear that?" And they say, "Yes, there's tanks out there." And they get they reported it up the line to intelligence. And a lot of intelligence officers were saying, "Look, the the crowd's up to something," uh, but nobody seriously thought. Now, this is this is an interesting point. The highest intelligence levels of intelligence analyzed all this information, and they said, "Well, you know, they might launch a spoiling attack, you know, a disruptive attack." But they would. They haven't got the resources. They wouldn't waste the resources they had, they have remaining. We had a pretty good idea of that, um, because you know they they couldn't replace them. Well, that was the logical assumption. Hitler was not logical. So you have to you always have to take into account the possibility of an illogical you know enemy commander, which uh, often shows up. Not always, uh, but that was especially true during uh, World War Two, and. People in in the West didn't, uh, you know, commanders in the West didn't realize the extent to which um, Hitler uh, would intervene and and make key decisions in the deployment and uh, you know the uh, the the uh, the tactics to be used by his own troops, uh, mostly his strategic decisions. If he had withdrawn uh, deliberately in the East, he could have chewed up the uh, Russians even more and delayed it. But again, you know, they didn't know about the A-bomb. So Hitler, in effect, you know, saved Berlin from getting nuked. Now there's a story. <laughs> there's some story that'll never get told in a book or whatever, but it's true. Um, but in the bulge, uh, you know, our intelligence analysts were correct. 
as were the guys at the front line hearing all those tanks rattling in the background. It was not a spoiling attack. It was, you know, it was a major offensive, uh, employing, I think, more more tank divisions than infantry divisions. And the infantry divisions that were used, uh, I think none of them were experienced. They were all new uh, divisions uh, which were built from scratch or divisions which had already been uh, raised earlier, not too much earlier, but then they destroyed in the, uh, in the race, you know, to reach Germany from the Normandy front. And uh, they basically put a lot of, uh, people into those divisions who had very little training all. and more importantly they had they had such heavy officer casualties uh, that they couldn't replace all of those so they realized they couldn't depend on those infantry units except to follow up and mop up uh, but a lot of the infantry units were the ones who were basically uh, uh, surrounding the uh, one side of the bulge and uh, the best they could do was hold the line and when the counteroffensive game they melted away from casualties if not from you know just being forced to retreat because otherwise they were going to get you know destroyed entirely so lessons of the bulge yeah now <clears throat> austin you've played one of jim's uh, bulge games a little bit i, I want to talk just a little bit about it before you uh, make some comments uh, decision well, I've game. actually played all of Jim's. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, has been all of them at some time or the other. But yeah, right. I'll, I'll I'll talk about bulge because <clears throat> it's uh, useful. I, I didn't mean to write that. One of the things is is Decision Games has uh, reissued bulge just within the last uh, month or two months. And the interesting thing is that uh, I have a copy of the old version, and I pulled up a copy of the new version rules and unlike a lot of other things that decision games when they reissue jim's games they tinker with them somewhat uh this one they left completely alone the rule set is exactly the same i'm sure they cleaned it up if there were you know any misspellings or like that but uh it looks like you know they they just reissued this one as it is so they saw that something good and they and it didn't need any improvement, at least in uh, their eyes. And I, I think that's true. It did not need any improvement. Um, but one of the things in the rules in uh, Jim's designer notes at the end, he says, and this leads into what you're going to talk about. He uh, he says there are two critical rules in the game that if misunderstood or not used properly will cause a player to lose the game. These rules are allied bridge interdiction and road and mechanized movement. So what what do you have to say about the bridge interdiction? <clears throat> okay, I, I, just to, to tell our uh, listeners a little background on this. For 15 years, I taught a uh, as an adjunct prof at the University of Texas in its Plan 2 Honors Program. I taught a uh, once a week, three hour seminar that was basically uh, a uh, a military history class where I concentrated on uh, understanding uh, uh, strategic situations and also developing plans. Now, th that sounds boring, but really what it was, strategy and strategic theory, Sun Tzu to uh, von Clausewitz, is, I think was one of the uh, titles, uh, uh, titles of it. <laughs> but I would have halfway uh, through the semester, usually about the time of semester break, I'd have uh, the students uh, play Jim's bulge game. Now, the way I describe that particular game is it's elegant. And I'm not using just a fancy word. It captures so many complexities well, and it's rather simple and playable. It really only has like five and a half pages of, of rules, which, you know, for old uh, SPI type uh, war games, uh, that's that's not much. Uh, but I'd have the, the department ran off extra copies of rules and I had uh, colored, uh, copied colored maps and, and the like. And really, I wanted the uh, students also to just kind of attack the game and see how a simulation is put together, because this is just paper dolls, little pieces of paper moving around on, uh, on paper. It's not real. But then I also talked to them about all right treating it as, as if it was a big matrix, which is really the way you can construct a, uh, a historical simulation like, uh, like bulge. One of the matrices would be terrain. 
but that's a complex matrix itself. And you would look at the map, the bulge map really was extremely well done. Um, and you could have a town in woods, woods that was also uh, uh, rugged, and you could have rivers running around, and you might have a bridge. So right there is a, it represents something very complicated, particularly for a mechanized wheeled unit, because it's going to be road bound if it's caught in close terrain, and close terrain can be uh, rugged terrain, mountains, mountainous, thick forest, and a city is close to rain. Cities are, and I, I'm a tanker, cities are dangerous places for tanks unless you have infantry covering you. Now, then, they, then the, the, the tank becomes an extremely, <coughs> excuse me, useful tool for the infantry so they don't have to get, be exposed uh, to, uh, uh, to, to snipers. You have to you know, definitely fight as a as a tank mech team or a tank inf a tank infantry team in a the closed terrain of a city, but let's go back to one of those hexes on the bulge bulge map, and I'll pick out one because I think one of them. I'm gonna I've got a little list here of what I, I've learned out of various bulge games as well as uh, reading forever. I think I Dan I think I read my first story about the Battle of the Bulge when I was seven, in a a uh, paperback that my dad got me and I was and I just plus I'm watching on the the big picture in the 20th century you know black and white television uh, <clears throat> f uh film from uh from the bulge so anyway I I uh, I we've got this complex piece of ter uh, uh, uh piece of terrain and trois ponts three bridges which is where the 82nd ended up interesting place for an elite airborne infantry division to take up uh, a, a battle position and a right on the nose of task force peepers attempted breakthrough uh in the north and that's a uh, peeper Joachim peeper was leading the the uh, primary uh, assault task force it was out of first ss panzer wasn't it jim i'm sure i don't know it was it was uh, trying to break through yeah. the ocean yeah. and um Right on his uh, right on his nose, as he's already running out of uh, out of gas. And you take a look at the map, the uh, the bulge map, and you'll see you'll see bridges there, but you'll also essentially see a peninsula defined by river going around uh, a, a built up area and lots of woods. Uh, ultimately, in in the in the uh, in the battle, and I mean this is something that, that I you know you you learn by reading the histories and even looking at the terrain because I've been I've been to Trois Ponts is that uh, what's left of Task Force Peeper tries to pivot and go around Trois uh, Ponts as and he's also he's running out of uh, he's running out of fuel and the weather's changed and uh, the uh, uh, Allied uh, uh, aircraft are back up. The P-47s are tearing up not just the German armor, but shooting up all the German supplies uh, and the uh, the uh, truck uh, logistical trail going <clears throat> going back uh, into Germany. So that's one thing that that the bulge game does very well is its map and it's again elegant simple and now you see why a airborne infantry division can go hole up in there and it might get hit uh, in the game possibly a couple of those monstrous ss uh, panzer divisions and still not be able to move it out and it, the way the, the way the rules are set up too it's it's uh <coughs> having uh, just a, it's it's a combat differential you know, a seven, four, that, that three uh, uh, power difference, if you're just in clear terrain, can be extra uh, extraordinary, uh, but not with all the defensive advantages that uh, uh, infantry in particular would get in the kind of complicated terrain that, uh, uh, that I described. <laughs> the whole thing about the Ardennes is that that kind of complicated terrain is all the way up and down and, and, and through it. And as 
as Jim said when he was uh, talking about uh, the 1940 campaign, the uh, Germans devoted a lot of staff time and intelligence time to figuring out how to to bring heavy divisions through there. Uh, 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 you can do it, but even and I'm going to get that's it is such a next to impossible to do thing, particularly with even the thin force mix and it's comparatively force that it exists in this U.S. sector on December 16th, 1944. Now, I want to go back to something else that you see. This comes out of, it's well uh, presented, but you have to understand the rules in, in, in bulge. The Germans have a huge first turn advantage, but they've got to get through the Lotion Gap where the 14th uh, uh, Cavalry is, and it must bust, at least uh, to, if you're going to uh, break through and get an, uh, get an early, uh, early victory, uh, the Elsenborn Ridge, which is on the northern uh, flank, the northern flank. Now, I'm going to move from, uh, you can do it. Jim and I played bulge once when I was still living in New York. We would get together. We must have done it four or five times where we'd play bulge on December the 16th just for fun. And usually <laughs> the U.S. won. One time I was playing the Germans and uh, I, it, it was unbelievable. Everything went perfectly with all the die rolls and uh, a panzer division exited off the uh, north side of the of the. Uh, 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 of the map, I, at the, it really at the end of turn one. Uh, never seen that happen before, and so Jim and I just quit right there and and and, la and laughed about it. It can happen, <clears throat> totally unlikely, but that is in some ways the ger would have been the German fantasy outcome. And what happened is is that 14th Armored Cav was uh, uh, was obliterated, and uh, on the uh, German mechanized movement with nothing in behind it across the what was it, the Ore River, I guess, and then and, and, and goes north. Now, that's at a highly aggregated level. It doesn't represent what really happened. Now, I'm going to talk about two little battles that were slowed up the, the first SS Panzer and its supporting units, the Volksgrenadier uh, uh, Division supporting it. They were supposed to bust down that road destroy 14th uh, Cav, and then knock 99th uh, Infantry Division. And I, Jim, I think that's the other green division you were thinking of as 106th when you were uh, talk, talking about that, because the 99th had not too long before uh, the 106th uh, replaced, uh, 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 moved in, had replaced, I think it was 9th Infantry. I, I, second... I, I think, oh yeah, Ninth Infantry, they yeah. were supporting 2nd Infantry into the Hurtigan. Okay, but they, so. they, they, that's right. But the thing is, is the 99th was up there. And then one of the most amazing uh, <coughs> events in, in World War II occurs, the uh, intelligence and recon platoon from, I forget which of the regiments, it's you know, the 300, 364th or something like that. Um, forgive me, guys, it was one of the greatest <laughs> Last stands, 18 men stopped a uh, reinforced elite German uh, battalion all day. And they were right on the road that Pieper was going to break through. And there is, in, in one of the German histories I, I read, Pieper actually goes to a, into a headquarters and he's angry and he's screaming about what has stopped, what has stopped us. And one of the German officers in there said, we thought there was nothing there, but there's a regiment dug in. No, it was just 18 men. One killed, everybody else wounded, and they all got captured. But uh, that threw the entire German uh, plan in the north, on the main, main, uh, the main breakthrough with their, their elite lead unit, off by a day. And that's, that was the reality. The Germans had so much combat power there that they if maybe they could have rolled and pulled off you know that what happened in a you know a, a, a game Jim and I were playing in New York but there were there were the, the 14th Cav two of its uh I forget which uh squadron was 
uh, it, it deployed uh, in, in the gap, two of its uh, troops, and they were just light armored vehicles and jeeps with machine guns held up the initial German advance, and some of them even managed to escape. And then the uh, the Lazarath Ridge, the that stopped that attack in a time for the rest of the 99th to dig in, and the 99th never got moved off. There was some shifting for the rest of the uh, rest of the battle. But the northern shoulder of the of, of the bulge, it was kind of, it was like a stake, S T A K E, in the uh, upper, uh, you know, on the right arm of the uh, uh, of the German advance. Uh, Maybe a mixed metaphor, but you get the uh, get the point. Uh, I, I'm, I'm 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 trying to make all the others. This is it ultimately it shifted the German attack to the south, which is why they're going through Bastogne and then. Sharp moves by uh, Jim was talking about our German generals. You mean like Eisenhower or Admiral Nimitz? Is another good one. Albert Wiedemeyer uh, ends up replacing uh, General Stilwell as a commander in China. So that's three German sounding names. Yeah, they're all had, had German ancestry. But um, <clears throat> the as they 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 shift to the south. One of the early decisions that was that. Uh, Ike's team made in uh, up in Spa, which is where his headquarters was, is that they were going to take the two airborne divisions, which were resting. Remember, they'd still gotten shot up in in uh, in Market Garden in in September, which were they were essentially strategic reserve and going to deploy them to key places to stop this uh, attempted German breakthrough. And 101st goes to Bastogne, and I already mentioned Trois Pont. What that uh, what that did? 80 seconds there. Also coming down, First Infantry Division. Jim uh, was t- talking about how uh, how savvy that outfit was. It was also considered by some other people in the American forces, not just the Army, to be a rogue or, or pirate unit because of their. Uh, <clears throat> when that Terry Allen was their original commander and Theodore Roosevelt Jr., their deputy commander, they uh, got in a lot of fights and Terry Allen got re- got relieved. But, but the unit was uh, a Terry Allen, T.R. Jr. Uh, uh, unit. They had their own, uh, a real identity, a real uh, 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 esprit. Something else I would add to what Jim was saying about picking up weapons. This started happening. The first ID did it. The third ID was doing it. Also, a lot of guys in Italy were picking picking this up as well. Finding uh, more automatic weapons than were authorized uh, because the Germans have got their MG42s, which can really lay down lead and and suppress you. But uh, I'm sorry, we're not just going to have two BARs per 12-man squad. We'll have three or four. And a couple of uh, a couple of Tommy guns, uh, and we're going to find more uh, machine guns than authorized for the company. They pick up more uh, 30 calibers, uh, and, and they really liked it. The, 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 the A4 version is the standard one on the tripod, but they really liked that little A6 because you could get it into action uh, quicker than uh, than the uh, tripod. So the experienced American divisions. Suddenly, some of them, and actually, Al Nofi did a study of this. This is uh, it. It brought home some things I'd read. He really, it was a good, a simulative study. Some of them were at 110 percent strength in terms of weapons. Another prized weapon, if you could pick one up, was a quad 50 on a on a on a uh, half track. And they're not, you know, they're supposed to be anti-aircraft units. Will you tell me that some even leg infantry unit that manages to get a hold of one, that they're going to want to give that up because they're not. Because you're talking about something that puts out lead and just erases uh, a, 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 a infantry assault. Even one uh, that's supported by light armor, it's uh, a, a quad 50 on a track. And Jim was mentioning, I think, you know, the, the small German 75 millimeter, those were little mountain howitzers. At least they call, call them that. A lot of them holdovers from World War II. Pretty effective weapon. Uh, but First ID wasn't the only uh, uh, American outfit that would pick up something like that because suddenly you've got, uh, you know, your own artillery right there with you. Now, I'm, after laying that out, a lot of these things are, are 
you, you don't see them if you just read bulge, but they're all elements of these are into the way uh, Jim uh, designed that particular, uh, particular game. Now, I'm going to move to the uh, bridge rule, which fascinating that uh, if you don't know, <laughs> you don't understand how that works, but I'll show you what it means. Jim was talking about um, America developing uh, advanced artillery tactics in the 30s. It starts really in the late 1920s with a group of captains and majors at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the artillery school. And they start taking, uh, using radios to change fire direction, uh, uh, fire direction, on-call fire direction. One of the problems out of World War I is everybody's relying on a radio or hand signals and you can't see anything. I mean, not on radio, running on telephones and an enemy barrage rips the wire apart. So they were going to use radios. They develop a, a, a system, which is re really a, a, a fire, a call for fire, uh, a call for fire system. And where somebody can be a forward observer and somebody's back at a, well, I don't remember the original name. They had something, but it's a FDC, Fire Direction Center, that can coordinate uh, the, uh, uh, the the guns that are to the rear. And essentially, it is moving fires. Think of it as moving massed fires across the battlefield. If you think Blitzkrieg is maneuver on this, well, they, they, these artillery officers are developing a way to maneuver fire using uh, 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 using the radio, and then using observers even uh, in uh, in the air on a uh, airplane with a uh, with a radio. By the mid 1930s, they've developed a system, and they did all this, you know, this was analog uh, computing, where you can have, as, as Jim was saying, guns spread out all all over the area. But because they're all connected by uh, radio, then they know where they are, is that they developed a, a firing schedule, very tight one, so that they could fire their rounds and all the rounds would land simultaneously or near simultaneously on a selected target. It would give, in other words, just one forward observer the ability to, uh, oh, let's say if you've got five battalions and 18 guns, uh, 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 a, a, a battalion, you know, you've got 108 guns, uh, over 100 guns that you can bring in as long as as long as they're in range, and wham, you catch them by surprise. It's long range. Think of it as long range mass uh, uh, sni uh, sniping, and then you can keep pouring it on them if it's if it's uh, on the on the target if the the target is uh, worth the expenditure of ammunition. They. The name for this, and the name actually seems to come out of the Mediterranean, either late late 42, maybe 1940, probably 43, because uh, Truscott, uh, uh, Lucian Truscott mentions it, is time on target, T-O-T. Uh, that apparently was just a quip, and now, of course, that's the term, uh, the term for this kind of masked uh, mass fire attack. You can do it once you have perfected the system and trained the artillerymen and have have the fire direction center operating, you have all the firing tables and you have the, the forward observers. It's 24 hours, doesn't matter what the weather is. And the rule that Jim has in bulge, as, as long as there is an American unit within three hexes of a bridge, they can be interdicted, even though it's not on top of the bridge. Now, what it's representing really is the ability for of American artillery firepower to uh, destroy thin-skinned vehicles, trucks, or horses, because Jim was mentioning how horses were still very, very important to uh, German logistics, and therefore cut their supply chain. Doesn't kill. Uh, 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 a German unit at that range, but it hurt harms the combat power of German uh, units that are depending on that bridge for supply. And it is it's it, part of it is is the uh, fire direction control system, U.S. ability to move in mass mass fires doesn't just go in one place. 
they're not get, the guns can just you know, swivel and they can hit a target to the south and then they can hit a target to the north and then one uh, facing to the east. And it is it's when I when I say use the term elegant, it's it is important and it represents a tactical, a very advanced tactical and operational technique that the U.S. was uh, we, we were leaders in it. It was part of our combat system. Uh, and it's sometimes using the word system is 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 is, is misleading, but there's a interesting uh, essay written by a, a young uh, officer I worked with uh, when I was on duty in Iraq. I even had him come by and, 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 and lecture my class one time on it. He was getting his PhD uh, at Harvard in, in uh, military history. Even though he was still at Hood, he was you know finish, finishing his, his, his doctorate. And he says, uh, to, to, to my students, he says, you, you need to think of this because of the Germans certainly had better tanks, Tiger Ones, Tiger Twos, uh, Panthers, and, and the like. But they didn't have a better system because of our ability to control fires and also some of the things that, that, that we knew how to do by 1944 and by in France, 1944 and Germany, uh, 1944. Plus when the weather clears up, here come the P-47s and uh, uh, there's, there, goes, there goes your rear area because we just had, as Jim said, it was air supremacy. And it was, uh, you know, one of the things that even made the bulge possible is that they had six, seven days of bad weather before the uh, sky cleared. And suddenly here come the, not just the fighter bombers, but also the C-47s who can drop supplies to surrounded uh, allied units. Uh, we could resupply. And uh, they could, German still Luftwaffe managed to fly some harassment raids, but uh, or, uh, but it, it was it was harassment. They uh, they were it, it was a, a defeated air uh, defeated air force. And now you you see it by really by day six, the twenty second of 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 December, and that's before. Um, uh, Bastogne is, is uh, relieved on the 26th by 4th Armored Division, uh, Creighton Abrams and uh, Combat Command R, 4th Armored Division, busting through. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a small break, but <laughs> it was a break. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly over by then, even though the battle goes on until the, uh, as the Germans withdraw until the end of uh, uh, latter part uh, uh, of January. And as you pointed out, Dan, it really is several battles because the north wind, the Germans are launching another attack down uh, to the to the south that was supposed to catch us in the <coughs> and, and really didn't. Though, but it was a very bitter battle uh, and, and, and extremely cold weather. So yeah. I, I think I've I think I've talked through that. But that that's I'm glad to, to know they didn't touch the rule structure of, of bulge. It really, if, if I sound like I've studied it, heck, I played heck out of it, but it does a good job from a historian's uh, point of view and really from, uh, uh, I'm a something a history of, uh, of, of military operations, historian of that. It does a very good job of, of simulating it. Yeah. And it's good if, if you're not in, haven't entered war games, uh, you know, go up to decision games and order a copy of Bulge because it's a very good introductory game. Like you said, it uh, only has a few pages of rules. Actually, a lot of Jim's uh, really good games are that way, is that he's able to pack a whole bunch of stuff into a minimal set of rules and simulate things. And so, you know, I'm just amazed as I go back and look at his games um, and look at the rule sets and like that, I go, wow, you know, uh, this is known as a super game and it has so many fewer rules than the games that are being published today. Some of the games being published today, I think they've forgotten the elegance that you can do in a design without overloading it with a lot of Chrome. Can I, so, can I toss, uh, look, I know I've been on, uh, on this and it's, it, it, Jim knows uh, I really admire, admire the game, but I want to make other, one other comment too on, on some of the, 
uh, changes, quote unquote, or the improvements in American uh, military preparation. One of the things I absolutely hated when I was in the 11th Armored Cav in Germany was staying in the woods and the snow for days on end. And then when I was in 1st Infantry Division, same, uh, same thing. But the reason we were doing that, and bulge would come up, boy, this must be like the Battle of the Bulge. You're in, the, in some, and don't think it's like Opry Ski in the, in the Rockies. You know, let's go in and, and drink uh, some warm, uh, a, a warm cup of coffee. No, you're out there five, six, eight, 11 days at a crack, living in the snow and out of your armored vehicles. And you're also on restrictions on how much diesel you can burn, so you can't use your heater uh, 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 all the time. And you're maneuvering, and you're tired, and you're you know, you're up for. Tw- tw- I remember one stretch. Yeah, we did it almost like back to back, twenty four, thirty hour uh, exercises. But the, the, there was a reason for doing it. You're going to get inured to the coal, know how to handle it, and survive uh, survive it if the Russians attack us in winter and pull a, a bulge and, and you know, think we can't get air support here and you're gonna we're, we're gonna do it we're not gonna get caught and lose everybody to trench foot and uh, again here i said talk about how mu- i still hate i hate the feel of that cold but i also know why we did it and in in the back of everybody's minds out there is look what happened in n- december 1944 uh all right, and that's the kind of the training Jim was talking about that comes out of the the, the Reformation that uh, he and Ray Macedonia were writing about, and, and what uh, uh, Gordon Sullivan uh, uh, really was a point man uh, in in that kind of rebuilding the army after uh, after Vietnam. Hard, hard, tra- hard, realistic training. So. Yep. So one of the things we we didn't get into much was uh, the other part of the uh, campaign that most people know about, which is Bastogne. Um, Jim did a game specifically on Bastogne, and it might be good to come and talk about that one of these times. Uh, thank you guys for being here, and thank you for all the information you give our listeners. And I and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.